So like I said, I mean, I, I know very little bit about you. I'd love for you to share something. I, 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 like I said, we got thrust into this because a couple of reasons we'll get into those later. But mm -hmm. initially, the, the part about this is I'm here for you to share your art and where you came from and how you got to where you did. I'm not here to ask you the generic interview questions. I'd love for you to share how you see it. Um, this isn't question answer stuff. This is just a curiosity about picking your brain and how you got to where you got. Yeah, no, first off, thank you for reaching in. I appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. You know, sending the invite, and it was through a Twitter conversation, so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was, it was an interesting conversation. We'll get to that a little bit later, I'm sure, because uh, I got a little, well, we'll talk about it, but nothing too crazy. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, a little about me. I started to dance um, quite a while ago now, and... I'm sorry, let me turn my phone on silent. I started off as a dancer at 15. And then, of course, I was inspired by Michael Jackson. I was inspired by the Twins and Daniel Clark, these other dancers. And just watching like hip, hip hop dancers on TV, like Mr. Wiggles, he was in a Limp Biscuit video, and I just went absolutely insane. So I watched that, and then I basically I went to university to study forensic science, but that was more my parents wanted me to be educators and I kind of, I graduated, but I, I got straight into dance after. I, that's, I knew that's what I wanted to do. So I had about seven and a half years of training full time. And then I started auditioning. So were you dancing while you were going to uni at the time? Yeah, I was. Okay, were I you was. part of like a dance troupe or some kind of group or? I wasn't, no, and actually I never was. I, I, my whole point with dance was to create my own style. So I kind of learned it back, backwards. And it's only now that I realize that. It's like having a seven leg. I tried to create the shell and then have the foundation. So I kind of did it a little backwards. But uh, you, you know what, though? We find, we, we find a lot of creativity that way, though. I mean, it's kind of like sometimes reinventing the wheel does come up with a new idea. Maybe not a new wheel, but a new, a different idea, an offshoot. Yeah, absolutely. Because my whole point was, if the Boogaloos can create a dance style in the 70s, and they had no base to go off, I mean, of course, they had jazz and certain dance forms from the South America, from South America. Why can't we today create something new? That was my whole point right. with dance. And absolutely. I kind of got, got to a level where I, I was creating my own language in dance. And then I got a little older and, you know, now I still dance, but I don't want to pursue it professionally. And I kind of had a natural transition into video because I used to film my own. I used to actually, I filmed every single rehearsal. I think I can count them on one hand, the ones that I didn't rehearse, didn't film. Because wow. I used to go home and watch it and see my mistakes and quit my angles and everything. And um, so that kind of fell hand in hand with that. And I, I would have the, the idea in my mind that I started filming stuff. And then from there, it was a real quick transition back home in England. So I started uh, filming weddings and, you know, artists here and there. And it sure. kind of fell in love after years, fell in love with documentary. And you I filmed up behind the camera when you, were, when you were performing in front of it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Interesting. That's right. And then Have you ever thought about movie. releasing all yours on YouTube or anything like that? Just putting a progression of all the dates and... Oh my God, no. And actually a lot of the rehearsals <laughs> I lost because there was a hard drive that actually broke. I yeah. do have some of them still. It was for years. I, I think I trained full time for about seven and a half years. It was like six, six to seven days a week. So do, do you mind if I ask what, uh, I didn't look up your specific bio. How old are you or what, what year were you born? If you don't mind me asking. 83. No, no problem. Okay. okay so you're born, right. I guess what Spriller was 82. I think so. Yeah. 82. 82, 83, something like that, I think, right? So you would have been born right about that, the peak, right? Mm -hmm. So how how did you at 15, gr did you grow up enjoying that, you know, the style of Michael Jackson or did it hit at 15? Yeah, it hit at 15. I actually, I, I, I was never a fan before 15. Um, I'm talking artistically at that point. I remember watching certain things as we do. It's like osmosis. He was so big at that time, but I was never a fan. Right. And then it was Thriller and Beat It. 
that really got me. And then that led on to hip hop and jazz. But re re really in the beginning, probably for probably for that year, it was I was just addicted to Michael Jackson's style and learning where that came from and then watching all of the you know, the, the Jacksons, the, the variety show. There was like little clips on the internet and then, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I just watched a, I watched a documentary called Hitsville, and it's about Mo, it's about Motown, and they show a little Michael Jackson in the in the studio doing James Brown, and just watching him just glide just glide at like at eight or ten years old, you know, it's like it's amazing. So yeah, yeah and, and amazing. I, absolutely. So you so you grew up obviously outside of that. I'm a little older, so I grew up with kind of with him. I grew I was born in '74. So he's a little older than I am, but so young Michael Jackson would have been, my parents would have introduced me to Jackson five and all that. And then I grew up obviously with the other stuff. So, so you got in the dance. So then you really got into Michael Jackson kind of as a person as well with the dance. Did it kind of go hand in glove or did that come later? And that kind of came later. I was only interested in the artist side, the creative side of it. And it, although I was in, I was inspired by Michael Jackson's dance style more, more because he had an emotion attached to the dance and I couldn't really find that with another performer. Uh, and actually, I would say the little twins, these two twins out of France have probably inspired me more as dancers than Michael Jackson. I don't know if you've seen the little twins, they're absolutely incredible. I have not. I, I, I'd love to though. I'd love to hear some of that. If you have some information, you can share it. I'll even post some information on the, like in the notes of our, of our conversation for sure. Okay. They're pretty established now. They were on tour with uh, Beyonce and stuff. And they were on oh, wow. They're, they're, they're amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, I'm more, I come from a singing background more than a dance, a physical background. <laughs> nice. So I come from, the, I come from the easy stuff. I can sit there and sing versus having to actually sweat and do motion, things <laughs> like that. So. It's not easy. Singing is not easy. <laughs> So you graduate uni, you dance for seven, you said seven years professionally? I trained professionally for about seven and a half years, yeah. And then did you go right into film after that, or did it go into actual dancing on and performing on stage before the film part came in? Um, it was kind of a natural transition, really. Um, I kind of always filmed, but then it, the, the paths kind of switched. As I got older, yeah, and I think that's what happened. Okay, so what kind of things have you done prior to to the to the Michael Jackson piece? So I've worked with the. So I have a company, Take Flight Film. Yes, and I saw that. So take flight, takeflight dot com. Uh, is it takeflight dot com or take dot flight? Take flight dot film. Dot film. Take flight dot film. Okay, thank you. I just want to share it with everyone so they can. Yeah, no problem. Um, so what, so what I do is that company kind of makes social media content for companies. It's totally unrelated to the documentary, but it's just how the business runs. Right. Absolutely. Um, for sure. And then the documentary side is another aspect of that, where it's all the funding, actually all the funding that I'm getting, any product goes straight into the film. Right. So that's what I'm doing with that. I hear you're very close. To the end. To to the funding portion of it, um, I'm actually not no. I've done about half. I've got about half to go. So okay, actually, half. Yeah. Well, so everybody just, out there, you know, do you have a GoFundMe or anything? I do have a GoFundMe. Yeah. You want to? If you like, feel free to share it now, and then we'll we'll also post it on the notes as well. Okay. Should I send it on the? Yeah. Is it? Uh, is it? Can we look it under your name, or is it under the title somewhere in GoFundMe? It should be under the title. Let, let me just double check here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so very interesting. So you then got into right into film, and then is this your first documentary then of of all the things you've done, or did document is documentary brand new to you now? Um, so I would say it's still kind of new, but I have done a few in the past. Nothing of this caliber that I'm trying. I saw. Um, were you doing some editing for? Did I see CNN or some other news organizations? Yeah, that's right. So when I graduated here, I actually, I, I studied film at UCLA. And when I graduated, I worked with a production company in North Hollywood, and we worked on a whole bunch of CNN documentaries. 
And that's actually was my education in documentary. I don't know how my, what, I was there to do a certain job, but I was just studying everything. I was looking at how they noted things. And actually, I'm putting all that into effect now because I've got, this room is covered in notes. <laughs> <laughs> right, I know exactly what you mean. So, so you went to UCLA Film School. So you spent how many years in the United States? I've been here since 2016. Okay, and you're currently in the United States. I am, yeah, I'm back. Excellent, okay. Film. Well, welcome, excellent. Are you looking to possibly get dual citizenship, anything like that? Or you look, are you a UK citizen uh, through and through? I'm a UK citizen, but I don't, I don't know, really. I'm just here to make the film. Um, I've not really thought about that. I'm just, as long as I'm here to make the film, I just want to make the film and get my interviews done. All right. Well, do you mind if we get a little bit into the film in a general sense, like a 50,000 foot sense? I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Let's go for it. What about the subject matter? Obviously, we understand you became a Michael Jackson fan in general, but a documentary takes a lot of effort and a lot of focus about a specific topic. In this case, I would guess the topic is justice in some way, right? Or some, there's a big def def defamation of Michael Jackson. And there's some kind of overlying or underlying justice issue here. Is that correct? That's correct. But I feel the, the film, because it's grown in scope since I started it, and I knew that would happen. Of it's course. It's a bigger issue than justice. As, as big as justice is, it's more about how we treat one another. So it's more of a social analysis of Western cultures, cultures, the, the way the West absorbs certain moments in pop culture and what that kind of says about us, that's what the film is about. Very interesting. Michael Jackson. So it's, a, it's deeper. I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead, please, please. So Michael Jackson's more just the overlay for this underlying bigger he's the, issue. He's the thread that tells the story. So he's the, the person where we look through his lens at certain aspects and I mean, I'm not answering questions in this document. It's not here. you know, I'm giving people facts. That's absolutely not, that's not what I want to do. I want to make something that's real and hits people. Right. Um, and I want everybody to watch it. Absolutely. So, for example, Danny's is a little bit more in the factual-based documentary. This is going to hit a little bit more emotionally. Or, yeah, or, or in a, more in a soulful way than a, than a logic way. Hopefully, yeah. And um, I mean, with the facts, I do have to share the facts. Um, I'm just absolutely, yeah. People, people don't really want to be forced. You don't want to watch a documentary where they're just listing off. Evidence, right. You know? Right. Well, I don't know if you know my background, but I actually was. I actually watched Leaving Neverland, and it affected me very poorly. Oh yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I did a. I like I said, I did a podcast with Haj, and basically the beginning of it tells i share exactly what happened to me but then i spoke with jess garcia who unfortunately has passed away r.i.p jess miss her but uh uh she showed me uh you know the uh other documentary was it a uh, square one and all that and we spoke a lot and through that she compelled me to change my mind so you know, we are capable of these things. And I, I just want to be clear about where I come from because I was not, I, I'm not speaking with you about also Michael Jackson. I mean, Michael Jackson's huge and the family, the MJ fam that is on Twitter is unbelievable. I mean, if he were alive today, it would rival Taylor Swift very easily without any problem. You know what I mean? I mean, posthumously, posthumously he's doing, he's, so influential still you know but mm -hmm. um i it wasn't a, it, my my thing is not a michael jackson thing you know it really was about the way we were told a story a narrative in the news and how untrue that was and how that for me plays into everything from military to oil to even you know green energy stuff that we're being told falsehoods or being manipulated in some way or another when we clearly have facts here and they take them and they they twist them yeah absolutely so share me a little bit about your philosophy about how how the west treats people and and how we could be better something maybe not, not in the film that you're sharing but something that you know your introspection and how you've come to this 
realization? I think, so I'm born and raised in Britain. Let me start off with this. And my parents from India. And I think having both cultures, I mean, I'm born and raised in Britain, so I'd say I am British, but we have a little extra culture there. So it gives you more of a top-down view on certain things in society. For sure. I think the West, free speech is amazing, and I think it's so important. But I think the way the media, you can't really police the media, because I think it goes against free speech, kind of. Um, but because there's profit to be made, there's certain aspects of society which are going to be pushed forward in the news, and that's just naturally just how things are going to work. Um, people want to make more money, they want to get the views, they want to get those clicks. So it's, it's kind of an animal within, within itself. Uh, that, I mean, I think I feel like it's our job to police the media, the public. Oh, absolutely. Think, yeah, well, we it is our job. We should not support them in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, that's right. And actually, I mean, since the internet, the, the power of the, the legacy media has changed because people right. now get their information on Instagram and Twitter, you know, TikTok even. And I don't even call it mainstream. I don't even call it, I call it corporate media. I mean, it's mm -hmm. clearly bound to big pharma, big oil, you name it, you name the industry and God forbid they speak poorly against it. Right. I mean, let's be honest, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, if you would think that big film with, if you think about Harvey Weinstein, for example, and how that was used to cover up, uh, Michael Jackson was used to cover up his indiscretions back in the nineties. The early night was 93 was a specific example with AJ Benz, I think. It's yeah. crazy that 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 was to protect big film because film puts advertisement out on those news news stations. Um, yeah. So going into that, did did you happen to see? We're, let's get into free speech because it it is a big thing. I'm an American. I'm I'm also a first generation American. So I I my parents both came from Germany and they met here. So oh, <laughs> my grandparents were both Nazis. Um, my one grandfather then became a communist because he became part of East Germany forcibly. Mm -hmm. So obviously it wasn't a choice. And then they escaped East Germany in 1953 and came to East Germany, uh, West Germany, and then came to America. My, nice. my father was in Hamburg and he had four, si four siblings and one of them died uh, from the war, from malnutrition. He walked with his mother hand in hand, 120 miles from like Hamburg to Berlin to avoid bombs. I mean, they had a crazy, crazy rough childhood. So I saw what fascism and what communism brought to my personal family. And I was born in America. So you can only under, understand my natural knee jerk reaction to tyranny, right? <laughs> Just a general natural reaction to no authority. I have a, I have a little bit of a disagreeableness with authority and that's where speech comes in. Right? So this, this thing came up with Jimmy Carr where they played a clip of some other show where the person actually said the word. I'm not going to say the word. It's not worth it. But clearly made a derogatory comment about Michael Jackson. Jimmy Carr said, well, isn't he? Okay, that one certainly is defamatory. But his other part was a joke. I understand from a personal perspective, it's not funny because of the emotional attachment. But if we restricted that in any way, what happens when the people in power restrict your voice to, to show the truth, right? So yeah. that's, and that's the sticky wicket, right? I, I just want to share my side of it because I am on the side. I, it's my opinion that Michael Jackson is, not, is innocent, if not not guilty, for sure, okay? That's not this issue. The issue is what happens if it's your speech that's the one that's actually the truth that gets held down? And we saw this through the vaccines, and we saw it through a lot of different things in these last couple of years. So I'm going to shut up because I talk too much, but I'd love for you to give your perspective from your parents in India, coming to the to UK, you being born in the UK, and then coming here, and, and you must have all a beautiful round feel of that, of the speech issue. Yeah, I, I feel like nobody really mentions free speech in England. It's really here, and I think um, the way America is, people really appreciate their freedom because the, the, the history of America is so condensed. And so many things happen over a short amount of time. Um, 
it just gives you a top-down view of certain aspects because the, the way the media is consumed over in Asia is different. Um, nobody really mentions allegations or anything when you talk about Michael and Pat Pelcher over in the East. And, I mean, with comedians, of course they should be able to say anything, but I think there's a there's an underbelly there of ignoring a certain issue with certain demographics in society that's not really fair. And it's actually partly, actually not partly, hugely why I'm making the film, because I feel like people are, it's almost like people live in different dimensions and they just don't get it. Um, but I can give you a quick example, actually, and I hate to really mention Elvis Presley because I do like Elvis, but it's like, with uh, there's nothing wrong with there's nothing wrong. Hey, look, every we're all human. We all have positive and, and negative about ourselves. So there's no way. Yeah, it's it's just an aspect that kind of puts it more into perspective. So with the so Michael what about Bi Elvis? Yeah. So with the Michael biopic coming out, you got certain media outlets raising issues, and I'm sure it's because they know that the fans are going to click on it and share it. But with the the Elvis biopic, there's a there's a moment where he's in Germany, and Priscilla is in his room and they kiss. But she was underage at that time. But well, that's okay, and everybody can breeze past that. But somebody who is acquitted on every count, they, there's not that same understanding. And I understand you can joke about it, but with saying it with such conviction, I think is wrong, actually. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I mean, it's certainly. It is certainly the media's responsibility to be ethical about the speech. Yeah. Al almost right. to the point, and, I, and only because I come from comedy, if I still believe that Michael Jackson's stories, I might make that joke still. So, but it's only because someone was able to tell me and show me another way, right? Another truth for me to compel me to change my mind, right? So... To your point, I agree 100%. The conviction part is a little, is very hard to swallow, but it, I'd like to reach out to Jimmy Carr and say, hey, this is probably not one to joke about. Let's, let's talk about it versus, I mean, and it's fine if you want to make a joke, but that's on you. And obviously what I love is look at all the beautiful speeches come out in support of Michael Jackson from this incident. So it's like, once again, the positives still to me are outweighing the negatives because I was compelled to change my mind with speech, you know? But you do raise some excellent points about that. But I give you an example. I understand in comedy, it's a little different in, in England as well. With uh, There are two guys, Chris, they were on Joe Rogan and they spoke about kind of comedy about you're not, you can hold up a card where you don't want to be offended. So you, there are certain things that are very not, or that are banned or, or taboo or. Uh, you mean in England? In England, that's what I've heard. Now, I, I may be wrong, and maybe you don't have that no. experience. So, I've not had that experience, actually. Not. And I'm going to be honest. British comedy is my favorite. Dry that's wit, it's just an absolute thing. So, all right. So, is, is there anything you'd like to tie in regarding the speech, once again, with how, how we're treating each other, right? It's not always what's said, right? It's how it's said. Uh, Maya yeah, Angelou it's... always... <laughs> Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, Gatron. It's again. Oh, I was just going to say, Matt, my Angelou said, uh, people are going to forget what they what you did for them, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, if you'd like to expound a little bit, just put a bow on that, and then we can... I've got one other question for you, for me, and then I'd love for you to share whatever else you'd like to share. Yeah, um, so it's quite interesting, because with this film, when I started it, it kind of, I knew it was going to grow, as I mentioned, so with free speech and just pop culture in general, I feel like there's certain, so I, I need to be careful with what I say because I don't really want to release too much information about the film. I want people to watch it. <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. I don't want to spoil anything, but you know, like I said, just a general, like a you know, feel of it. Yeah, no, so it's an analysis of pop culture really. And actually, what did you ask me? Oh, I was just asking how, when we talk about the free speech part and how mm -hmm. the Western culture has obviously defamed Michael Jackson specifically, and it seems almost like a campaign, right? Yeah, 
Is it, see, I'm very anti-conspiratorial minded, and a campaign, I don't really, I mean, maybe it is, it's, it's possible. I mean, the evidence is there, kind of. Well, I, I, if, I may, if I may restate that as well, um, let's say that it got a lot of clicks, so people followed suit. Yeah. How about that? That might yeah. be maybe a follow the leader kind of thing. Yeah, and actually it goes to my point where the, the media functions on profit. It's all about the dollar symbol. Yeah. That is what drives it. If people can get the attention, and Michael Jackson always gets the attention, which is incredible, really. I yeah, mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Over 10 years. Yeah. yeah I, did, you, did you have a chance to speak with Charles Thompson at all? Um, just, well, we're, we're friends, so I did meet him just generally. Oh, okay, in, excellent. In England. Nothing yeah, I haven't had a chance to meet him. He, he does oh, some great work with actual real pedophilia and real criminals. This, yeah. the, the, this, the exposés he's uncovered. And I mean, that just speaks to the, the, the credibility of this case, right? You have, a mm -hmm. you have a gentleman who's basically been doing journalism on this for his entire life, and he looks at this and goes, I don't see that. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, it's something that the Michael Jackson community on Twitter, I don't think they get the credit because a, lot, a large amount of them are kind of older. And the, the, some of them have families. I'd say a large majority have family or kids. But they're not just going to say somebody's innocent because, hey, we like the music. They're going to research, they're going to find things ahead. So it's almost like I'm making the film. I started off as a dance inspired by Michael Jackson. Who else would make this film? It, you'd have to have that interest in doing it to make it, because the film's not going to exist. I mean, if I can ask, ask you a question, have you ever seen a documentary on Michael Jackson that was either neutral or positive post-1985? Well, the only one was square one. Mainstream? So, what's on, that? On TV or... Oh no, I've never seen anything pop. No, the only well, the I guess the Oprah Winfrey, the first interview in '93 would have been, but that launched her, right? And yeah. then she capitalized on the back end of that. So, <laughs> yeah. with with the uh, conversation in Leaving Neverland, so you know, yeah, she she uh, plays chess very well. <laughs> she 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 got it on both minutes. ends. She 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 got elevated twice for for both sides of it. Very interesting way to look at that. The most viewed interview in history is the. It is the most viewed interview in history. That's absolutely right. So it's shown that we have about 10 minutes left or so. I think something popped up here because I don't have like special Zoom. But could I ask you a quick question about India? Do you have any, are you into any of the politics in India with what's going on there? I'm not. Okay, I'll let I'll I won't put you on, I won't put you on the spot then. So please feel free to continue sharing anything that you'd love to share about um, just your general. You know, what do you have any projects upcoming or anything like that? No, the only project is this film. Um, I was in England for three months um, visiting family and working, um, and basically it's just this film. My whole it's twenty four seven. I just want to get this film done and dusted and finished and complete. I've right. been working on it for two years. Wow. Over two years now. Well, that's crazy. Um, yeah, well, I just... wish. <laughs> no, Sorry, go ahead, no, please. No, please, please. The film's just expanded and grown so much. Like, like I said, it's about pop culture, it's about the media, it's about Michael Jackson, of course. But it's just everything that pop culture entails and how we kind of perceive each other and the differences between the West and the East in some aspects. Yeah, for sure. Now, have you are you familiar when you say West versus East? Is East Hinduism, Buddhism, or is it more? Are we talking China? Because Middle East is is obviously different with with Islam, right? Versus Hindu, Buddha. So, which when you speak of East and West, or which regions are you speaking? If you just if you don't mind me asking, no problem. I'm talking about Asia. So the the way Asia. the news okay. functions over there, the media. Okay. Now, is how, how would you say it's different? I would say it's not so tabloid front heavy. Is it a um, lot more fact-based? I, would I wouldn't say a lot more, because I actually, to your point with India, I'm actually interested in to know what your question would have been. Uh, well, Modi, Modi's kind of scaring me a little bit. I mean, we've got the largest democracy in the, in the world. 
with over a billion people and it's becoming a religious cult and very uh very militant in some way and i've never thought of buddhist buddhism or hinduism as as militant uh, hinduism for sure right so it's a very interesting thing and the fourth largest or what the fourth richest man in the world just got busted he has direct ties with modi uh bbc just got the bbc offices just got raided by modi uh, the tax, the tax offices, because they did a documentary on Modi that paints him in a poor light. So he's been after them. He's been after Twitter. He's been after. He's sending his tax people into into all the the media outlets. I did not know this. Yeah, he's he banned this movie in India, the one from the BBC that makes him that paints him in a poor light. So one seventh of the world is unable to watch this movie. I mean, just wow. like that. So it's. I Right. And it's turning a little scary because he could shift very easily to China and Russia because they need energy too. Mm -hmm. Russia needs someplace to buy it, someone to buy it now. It's a very easy triad, especially with the number of people, the size, the ability. Businesses, corporations, Apple's looking to move up to 25% of their piece of their business, of their manufacturing to India now because they're leaving China because China looks bad. But India is not being better. They're not being better. They're the the leadership is being very tyrannical in a sense. So I see. You know, I do have some friends that are into politics, and they've told me certain things like this. But a lot of the details that you shared, that I don't, I'm not really too familiar with. I'm happy to share with you offline, but uh, if you could connect with your friends, I'd love to speak with them as well. Because I, there's someone uh, in India from India that's in the UK that I speak with. She's at Jaya Talk Show. I think she was connected in one of my tweets or something. But I'll, I'll send her your information and. She's a very interesting person as well. So, but um, yeah, like I said, I'm I'm so grateful for you, for you doing this and uh, showing some of these things. Once again, taking a step back, it's kind of with the speech, right? There's a there's a responsibility to it as well. You know, you don't mm-hmm. just walk up to people and like fuck off. You know, you just it's not yeah. that's not decor. I mean, there's a courtesy involved, um, but you know, there's some gray there and. If we if we start trimming the edges, I think more gets trimmed and it gets to the point where it unfortunately could get dangerous where the real voices don't get hurt at all because they can't. Yeah, that's right. And actually, I think the free that point that you made on free speech, I think it's so important to hear the right that we have to put up with the bad. And I think the right is so valuable that we have to make way for all of the, the BS. Yeah. To have that the right come in. And I think that's that's the problem is free speech, but I think it's the only way, really. Yeah. Well, so somebody... if you know anybody in the entertainment industry and get us with Jimmy Carr, I'd love to sit there and talk with them and say, "Hey, look, man, let's let, let's look yeah. at this. Let's look at this from a real realistic perspective. There's plenty of other people to shit on that actually have done I, bad things, you know." Yeah. So I, I really I, hope I, we do get it. It'll be an interesting watch. I love that. Well, it's interesting because there's a gentleman named Michael Malice who's a comedian. And mm-hmm. I think I liked something he had said and I retweeted and someone reached out to me from the Michael Jackson community and said, I don't know if you know this, but he's made jokes about Michael Jackson. I said, I appreciate that. I really do. Mm-hmm. However, I didn't like his Michael Jackson joke. And I, you know, he, he, has, it's our job to compel him to change his mind. So he doesn't do it. That's how I, that's how I see speech, right? is to use the speech in a positive manner to help people see different angles that they weren't shown or couldn't see before. That's right. Yeah. Just to open a door. So that yeah. To open a door. And with that, like I said, it doesn't change the fact that it's been used very poorly against Michael Jackson. Both things are true here. Yeah, yeah so. absolutely. I mean, Michael Jackson was a punchline of the nineties. And I do feel like if a comedian is making jokes about Michael Jackson in 2023, it kind of goes to show their caliber of it, it is a little bit. I'm not going to defend the comedian. I'm not going to defend what he said. He was asked on that show for this obvious point. So in my opinion, I actually blame the, the journalists, quote unquote, journalists that even brought him on there. You're asking Jimmy Carr, the offensive British comedian, to make a, an offensive joke about someone who you think or whatever, who you paint in an offensive way. I mean, yeah. It's uh, it's cal it's it's unconscionable from that perspective. Not from he's going to make the joke because it's there. I mean, what do you want? And I'm not once again 
please, I want to be clear. I'm not defending what he said. Not at all. Yeah. You, you know what? That's very interesting, actually. They obviously knew exactly what they were doing, what they were saying, right. what was going to happen. So just making fun, just not really understanding the issue as it should be. And right. getting the comedian that's obviously going to say something. I mean, and the, and the clips all over the all over Twitter, all over the place, man. Because yeah, of, absolutely. It that attention. Yeah. Well, we've got a minute left. We could we could restart a conversation, or we can end it here if you like. Uh, are there any other words, or did you want to have, continue the conversation? That, that's, that's totally up to yourself. Um, with the film, I can't really share too much, really, because I'm at, yeah. I'm at a stage where I'm trying to. I'm working on the funding side and I'm editing a certain aspects of it. Right. All right. Well, well, thank you again. Once again, it's called trial by media, correct? Yeah. Trial by media, the Michael Jackson story. Okay. And it was, I think the GoFundMe was the MJ story, something like that. Yeah, I think it was the MJ story. So the, the hashtag for the film is trial by media, MJ. But trial the by media, MJ. The MJ okay. story. Doc. Excellent. Jin, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm going to try to get this up as quickly as I can before the weekend even. So let me try to get this uh, cranked out and hopefully we can talk in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to know more about you actually. Oh, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> There's not much to know, <laughs> but let's have that conversation in the future. Okay, Jin? Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Take care. Have a great day. Thank Enjoy you. the weekend. Take yes, care. Sir.